ladies and gentlemen, Mike Cannon. New York, what's going on? Oh my God. <laughs> All right, all right. All right, relax, I cry easy. <laughs> that's, uh, that's almost too much energy. <laughs> it is, I, I'm, a t I'm tired. <laughs> I hope I can match it. I, uh, I have a two and a half year old son. I'm with him all day, every day, so I'm tie tie. So all day, every day, I just daydream about doing cocaine. <laughs> I do, it would make me a better dad. It would, I'd be like, fucking cars? Yeah, let's go. Is this one a pullback? It's a pullback? I wish I could do cocaine. I guess I could. <laughs> it's not like court ordered. You know what I mean? I'm just 36. I used to do coke when my body was young enough to withstand that type of punishment. <laughs> but now at this age, if I did a bump of coke right now at 36 years old, I'd be like, this is the one. <laughs> Every valve in my heart would just be like I don't know, I'm tired, you know. Coffee's not cutting the mustard. Doesn't stop me from drinking it. I pound coffee all day, every day, constantly drink coffee. I'm never awake, but I am pumping with anxiety. Just have constant unwanted thought after unwanted thought. Then all of those thoughts have separate thoughts calling them gay. An incredibly confusing time. <laughs> I'll ask you guys, by round of applause, who here drinks coffee? <laughs> All right. Quite a few. By round of applause, who here does it work for? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We all drink it. It doesn't work. Coffee is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine of drinks. <laughs> it is. It has an incredibly low efficacy rate. But for whatever reason, we're all still lining up. I know, you know, that's just powerful PR. It is. It's dishonest. Big coffee spending them bucks. But it's powerful, right? I guess cocaine has some pretty dishonest PR. As well, right? Cocaine, what is it? It's a sexy drug. That's what my dealers have told me. Like, dude, do a little bit of this, you'll turn into Enrique Iglesias. I've never become a dewy-faced Latin man singing his heart out. I've never been sexy on cocaine. I've never had sex on cocaine. I've told a ton of stories about high school basketball. <laughs> but first of all, it's impossible because my penis is a clitoris on cocaine. Yeah, I haven't had sex. I've scissored on cocaine. I've mashed my mound into another gal's. While grinding my teeth and holding in a shit. I've done that. <laughs> Never quite made it in. I know, that's an aggressive way to open. It is, I, I don't know what, what I'm talking about. I don't know about you guys. You know, I, I feel like that's the biggest impact of the last two years on me. You know, is that I no longer know how to be. Just socially, I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know how to congregate. I'm, I'm suffering mentally and emotionally. Thank you, but I'm warning you about it. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people are messed up, right? People are going through it, but not a lot of people are communicating it. I feel like the craziest people right now, the most bat shittiest of us all, are the ones that are like, actually, it's been a really productive year. <laughs> I've read a lot, I've written a lot. I ride the Peloton four to six times a day just scream pedaling away from every single negative thought that I've had. It's been a really productive, yeah. I'm like, then why are you crying blood? I don't know, this city also, it's kind of, it's kind of easy to feel like you're losing your mind. You know, there's quite a bit happening out there. Especially now that we're in flux, but I don't know, I think New York will be back, right? We have some financial things in the works. Weed is now legal, I think. <laughs> Here's the thing, I smoke weed every single day of my life. I have no idea if what I just said is true. It's the worst legalization rollout of all time. I think it's legal. 
I heard it's legal. There's certainly no physical evidence to support that. I saw on an unverified Instagram account that weed is legal. And honestly, that's good enough for me. Personally, that gives me enough confidence. I'll smoke a blunt on the sidewalk. Blow hits at cops as they walk by. It's like, it's a new day, officer. <laughs> Hope you don't fail your piss test. <laughs> That's it. Re regardless if it's legal, it almost doesn't matter because it's been socially accepted in this city for a long time, right? You walk through a plume of weed smoke, nobody freaks out. It's pretty nice. That's not the case everywhere in this country. I travel a lot. I was just in Wilmington, North Carolina, and they, uh, they have a very different view of weed down there than we do up here on the north. <laughs> yeah, I was smoking pot in Wilmington, just a normal day, Thursday, 10, 15 a.m. <laughs> I'm with my buddy, we're smoking, having a good conversation, enjoying the clouds. And uh, people were walking by and giving us looks as if we were shooting heroin while eating each other's assholes. <laughs> in the middle of town square. Like, oh my God, are those two smoking marijuana? Are those boys smoking marijuana? They're doing a schedule one narcotic. In the middle of the day, while I'm walking with my son to the pharmacy to pick up a pain prescription I've been taking since high school. I done can't believe that boy is smoking marijuana. So it's terrifying. Came back up to New York to get safe even scarier here. It's weird, right? It's weird. The legalization timing is odd because they legalized weed in New York City while New York City is at its most terrifying. <laughs> That's weird timing. They're like, hey, hey, it's a little scary out there. Why don't you smoke this and watch it in IMAX? <laughs> so, okay, cool. <laughs> this, this Oculus won't come off. <laughs> you know, I feel like the parks... They, they're my favorite part of the city. They're the most beautiful, right? It's, it's a little bit of nature amongst all this industry. It's a cool contrast. Now they are a living, breathing nightmare. All the, all the parks right now are kind of like an outdoor escape room. There's exits everywhere, and I still can't find my way out. <laughs> I made a mistake. I smoked a joint and walked through Washington Square Park. Yeah, what a Dante's Inferno that place is. <laughs> like a true hellscape. There are so many different realities happening in that park. I have no idea which one is the truth, <laughs> right? There's like wealthy people, really well-dressed, walking through like they own the place. Then there's a guy riding a unicycle, playing the trombone. <laughs> then there's like hot NYU kids laying out in the sun, drinking Prosecco, eating cheese. Like, this is the greatest city in the world. <laughs> and just feet away, a dude with six open wounds is just leering. Uh, actually, it's the seventh circle of hell. <laughs> oh, I think I believe his reality. That's the thing. I, you know, I'm, I'm from here. I was born in this borough. I've lived in and around the city basically my whole life. So I feel like I have credibility to say this. New York City, our homeless, in terms of sheer talent, <laughs> is top shelf. Oh. <laughs> and that's not me like celebrating homelessness. I'm not pumped that there's people out there struggling. I'm just saying it exists and we have a gifted group. <laughs> right, like I said, I travel, I'm in other cities, I'm out there recruiting. <laughs> I was just in Spokane, Washington uh, and they have a very aggressive homeless situation there, like real sprinting zombies. For real, like the movie 28 Days Later, like, ha, ha, <laughs> run at you, and they're like, let me get five bucks. You look like you have five bucks. Let me get five bucks. Give me five bucks. And I'm like, but you haven't even done a dance or sang a Broadway medley yet. <laughs> Do you know where the fuck I'm from? I'm from New York. I just watched Cirque du Soleil on the six train. <laughs> And I gave those dudes a dime. <laughs> you want five bills just because you exist? That's white privilege homeless. <laughs> if 
feels weird to say this because actually the for the first time in a long time I, I don't live in New York City. Uh, I had a baby right before the pandemic. Thank you. Um, my wife did most of the heavy lifting. I kind of just went and then waited. Just tapped my watch for nine months. It was a real set it and forget it. But yeah, in May of 2020, we, uh, we, we left Brooklyn. We fled. <laughs> Our lease was up. <laughs> it was mostly the size, right? This two-bedroom apartment that felt like a palatial estate, especially by New York standards, started kind of shrinking in on us once we were no longer allowed outside. That and there was a large gathering of blood gang members that decided my front stoop was their home base. <laughs> and that's not positive or negative about the bloods. In case anybody here is initiated for life. <laughs> Lovely guys, they just weren't social distancing. <laughs> but honestly, it was mostly the size, you know, mostly the size of the apartment because we had this brand new baby. And honestly, the beginning of the pandemic, which sounds insensitive, it was kind of nice for us. We're a brand new family. We're so in love with each other. We're like, we, that's a brand new baby. We're like passing each other in the cramped hallways. Like, you go. No, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> You go, I love you, I love everybody. And then the months dragged on, right? My son, he's new to this reality, he's screaming. My wife is hormonal, coming off giving birth, so she's speaking in tongues. I am unreasonable at homeostasis. I'm trying my best to be an ever-expanding container of empathy. Failing, losing arguments constantly. I knew it was time to go, right? By the end, after a couple months passed, I could tell, because we'd like pass each other in the hallway. And it only happened like once or twice, but we passed each other in the hallway, and I would just kind of like throw a shoulder at her. <laughs> you know, just to knock her off track. She was just winning too many arguments. I would never do anything. I just wanted her to know that if I did, <laughs> it would be a flawless victory. <laughs> We actually, we just got our own place in September. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. But I know that kind of leaves quite a bit of time unaccounted for. Uh, for, about, for about 14 months, my wife and my baby son and I, we were living at my in-laws, uh, which believe it or not was not on my vision board at 36. <laughs> I'm grateful. Can you tell with how that just came out of my face? <laughs> I'm grateful. I am, I love them. They welcomed us into their home, very generous. Still a nightmare, both things can be true. <laughs> it's just 14 months of silent sex and arguments. <laughs> Say it right, can't yell in front of the baby. Now we have these two lifeguard adults kind of checking things out. <laughs> so all of our disagreements for over a year were just a series of pump fakes and eyebrows. Sexually, we were back in high school. I almost said middle school. <laughs> we were, we slept in my wife's childhood bed for over a year in her childhood bed. It was impossible to have sex. Couldn't get into the mind frame. She couldn't. <laughs> I could have sex in a river of blood. <laughs> Does not matter to me. My wife needs the ambiance, the incense, the tones. Really tough, you know, it's in my in-law's house. And I don't know, you and I, I feel like we've made a connection already. I, just I could tell when somebody is similar to me in this sense, sexually. I'm a really loud comer. Samesies. I'm talking like lion king of the jungle shit. Like I hop on in two, two, that's it, two, tops. <laughs> That's my hang time. My wife sees it coming though, sees me gearing up, puts her hand over my mouth, and I'm like, yeah, choke me, spit in my face. <laughs> Let's do something different. <laughs> That's the problem, you know? That's the problem with having sex so seldomly, <laughs> is I was just too excited to be there. 
every time I'm like, just so fired up, my tail's wagging. <laughs> I'm yelping, I'm making noise. My wife's like, you need to calm the fuck down. And I'm like, I haven't been to this park in a really long time. I wanna hit every ride. That was a problem. I'd get too excited, make a move, the bed would creak, I'd make a noise, my wife would fucking meerkat. <laughs> like, what is that? Is, is someone coming? Are they all listening? Is someone coming? And I'm like, no, nobody's coming. <laughs> Anymore. <laughs> Nobody in the whole house. We slept, on a, we slept on a full mattress, my wife and I. Two full-grown adults slept on the size mattress that you all give your dog. <laughs> I'm still in constant physical pain. <laughs> Brutal, and like, structurally it kind of should have worked. You know what I mean? Because I'm a relatively slender fella and my wife is a petite Italian woman. <laughs> but she sleeps like a fucking middle linebacker. <laughs> in bed, somehow she's six foot four, 325 pounds and runs a 4440. She covers the entire geography of the mattress. I was left with the Gaza Strip. <laughs> I had to contort my entire body to fit into this zone. I'm hanging off the mattress, holding on, trying not to fall off like I was a mountain goat trying to catch some Zs. My hoof would slip off. I was just constantly disrupting sleep patterns, having relentless nightmares where I was just plummeting to my death at all times. Have you guys ever had that nightmare? Right where you can actually feel your soul re-enter your avatar? Dude, three or four times a week. For over a year, three or four times a week. I'd just be in bed, just like, Aah! Just turn to my wife, like, sorry, I didn't realize I was back. She's just completely unbothered, enjoying her acreage. Every once in a while, she'd roll over, big spoon me, just to further emasculate me. I can't prove this to be true, but I'm pretty sure once or twice, she slipped a fingy in, I think. And she popped one in, whispered in my ear, just so you know who the dominant one is. <laughs> Which, joke's on her, I actually think the bottom is the alpha. <laughs> that position takes far more courage. <laughs> yeah, I'll let that one wash over. <laughs> Not only hilarious, it's objectively true. <laughs> So, you know, I am grateful, very grateful that they welcomed us into their home, super nice, still frustrating, obviously, sharing space with people you're not used to sharing space with can get a little crazy. <laughs> so, you know, it's frustrating, but I talked to people pretty, you know, about it, pretty much anybody who would listen. <laughs> and everybody was very nice, right? They'd try to offer sympathy or positivity, a silver lining, right? They're like, yeah, but dude, living at your in-laws for over a year, you've had built-in babysitters for over a year. It's pretty sweet. You had built-in babysitters for over a year. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, we went out a ton over the pandemic. <laughs> it's like, yes, absolutely. They definitely helped, right? But my mother-in-law, she was a teacher, so she worked through the entire thing. And my father-in-law, he didn't, he didn't babysit much. I guess I could have let him babysit more, but I'm pretty sure he founded QAnon, so. <laughs> yeah, he can watch my baby boy if I want him to be on a no-fly list by the time he's three. <laughs> I come home, he has all these new theories. It's like, hello, daddy. <laughs> Did you know Bill Clinton wrote on Jeff Wee Epstein's private plane? <laughs> 137 times. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Follow the money, young man. <laughs> that was my entire year. My entire year was Raffi's song, Apples and Bananas on repeat, while my father-in-law told me the truth about the vaccine. <laughs> Every day, I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Do you even know what mRNA is, dude? Do you know how it behaves with DNA? This isn't even a vaccine, it's gene therapy. They've never done this before. I like to oat, 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 apples and bananas. Yeah, there's, you know, quite a bit going on. <laughs> it was good, though. I actually look at it as like a year-long 
lesson in empathy and understanding. I really do, because I love my father-in-law. Absolutely. I love him. I don't agree with a single thought <laughs> that he has, but he actually gave me the gift of I no longer have public opinions. <laughs> it's not worth it. Before I moved into that house, I was a wild horse, couldn't be tamed. Love dialoguing, love sharing ideas, going back and forth with each other. My father-in-law hooked me to a leash, ran me in circles, until all I see now is tunnel vision for the finish line. I just can't do the conversation, I can't. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you believe, I know what I believe. I just want out. Especially socially and politically. Like right now, my social and political opinions are the exact same as whoever I'm currently talking to. <laughs> doesn't matter if I believe it, don't believe it, I just want out. Doesn't matter if somebody's like, dude, we gotta defund the police right now. I'm like, they should have never had money in the first place. <laughs> They're like, we need to evict these hippies using the National Guard. Like they've had it too good for too long. <laughs> you need to bully these dirty-footed teenagers until they're broken enough to get an office position. <laughs> we got to know each other though, my father-in-law and I. You know, I learned he loves drinking. <laughs> I don't drink and he took that as a personal attack. <laughs> so oh, we're pussy, you're not gonna drink, I'm gonna make shit uncomfortable. <laughs> No, but he has, he's lived an interesting life. Loves boozing, lived an interesting life. He has six really good stories. <laughs> and I've heard them all quite a bit, you know? But the one thing that I'm genuinely impressed at as a comedian is no matter how boxed up he is, no matter how many drinks he's had, he tells those stories beat for beat, word for word. <laughs> the exact same every single time. As a comedian, that's incredible. It doesn't matter, he could be hammered, passed out face down in a kiddie pool. And somebody's like, yo, yo, Mario, tell us about that time in the 70s. He's like, well, it was a warm July morn. <laughs> Just launches right into it. <laughs> we, uh, we celebrated Father's Day together. This was, this was my second, this was his uh, 856th. And Father's Day, it's interesting, you know what I mean? Do we have dads in the crowd? We have some dads? Yeah. <laughs> oh, what an enthusiastic group celebrated by their women. Good stuff. Isn't that how it's like six claps? Like, eh. If I was like, any moms in the building? They'd be like, yeah! What if, I, I mean, that is an exact microcosm of the holidays because, you know, if, <laughs> Father's Day is a day and Mother's Day is a holiday, <laughs> right? Mother's Day is a get out of the house. Get the hell out of the house, have a 24 hour vacation, go to the spa, get a massage, get your nails done, get the hell out of here. We don't wanna see you in the kitchen. We don't wanna see you near the kids. Get the hell out of here. And then Father's Day is, we wanna see you be a dad. <laughs> We're gonna invite over the entire extended family to audit your parenting ability. And not only are we not gonna make things easier, we might make things a bit more difficult every now and then. So I was on the clock all Father's Day, which I don't mind. My favorite thing in the world is being a dad. I fucking love it. But you know, it, it, once, it, once my son went down at around 7.30, 8 o'clock, that's when I was like, all right, I get to celebrate. I kept this kid alive for two years. It's pretty great, this day is now about me. So I took 500 milligrams of THC. <laughs> I was like, I have 80 minutes till bedtime, why not circle Saturn once or twice? <laughs> Speed skating them rings. So I sat down at the table and I was eating all the food human beings as a species has ever <laughs> made. And in ambles my father-in-law and he launches into a story and I'm like, fuck! This is four and a half minutes. That's how many times I've heard every single story. I know exactly how long they last from the launch until the dismount. But I don't know if you know any serial storytellers, you can't leave after the story because they've already launched into their second story. 
You have to plan your escape at about 3.45 into a four and a half minute story. That's when you start to back out of the room. So that's what I did. At about 3.45, I picked up my tray just like it was prison. Walked about 30 feet to the other side of the kitchen, threw it in the trash, turned around like a vampire. My father-in-law was right in front of me. And he launches into a second story and I'm like, fuck! This is three and a half minutes. So I'm trying to escape. I'm like looking over his shoulder under his armpit for a seam to break out, you know? And then I realized, I, I was listening, I was like, whoa, he's telling this story a little bit different. Out of nowhere, he's like performing it. He's putting his heart and soul into it. He's personifying characters. He's Mario, he's got talking to Mario. He's doing voices, he's putting everything into it. And I looked at him and I was like, you're getting better. Is that what this whole year has been about? You've just been workshopping an ironclad one-man show? Just to take out on the road once everything opens up? Well, you know what, Buster? Consider at least one ticket sold. <laughs> right before we left, about two weeks before we got out, <laughs> my father-in-law, he, uh, he bought a, f a flagpole off of YouTube I didn't know that was a marketplace. <laughs> Did you know? Did you know you could buy and sell things off the tubes of you? <laughs> I thought YouTube is where you go and you find out jet fuel doesn't melt steel beams. <laughs> then you take that information to a party and you ruin everybody's night. <laughs> I didn't realize you could buy and sell things. But he did, he got this flagpole. And he's a legitimate, brilliant engineer, right? Owned, operated, and repaired heavy-duty cranes his entire life. Ran the Transit Authority here in New York. Really, genuinely brilliant engineer guy. So he gets his flagpole, and he extends it 30 feet to make it even more flagpole. <laughs> and he has every flag that you would assume he has. Yeah, he's got the American flag. He's got the Betsy Ross 13 colony circle with the 2A in the middle, just as Betsy wove it. He's got the don't tread on me flag. He's got a blue lives matter flag and he's got a giant black flag with an AR-15 on it that says, come and get it. <laughs> That's what I was driving home to after shows. <laughs> Every night, sometimes I'd be scheduled for 15 minutes and I would do two and a half hours. <laughs> Just to delay the inevitable. But no, so the day after Father's Day, right? I'm, out, I'm downstairs, I'm in the kitchen, I'm feeding my son breakfast. And my father-in-law, he's one of these dudes, he's up already, right? No matter how many drinks he's had, no matter how boxed up he gets, he's up the next morning at 6 a.m. working. He's been retired for 10 years. I don't know what the fuck, it's insane. And I've watched him do it, he wakes up, and he's like, uh, that's over. It's like hangovers are for Libcuck Hillary lovers. He's literally been retired. I don't know what the fuck he's doing out there. It's like a complete prison job. It's one of those, take this pile of bricks over there, and then once that whole pile is over here, you're goddamn right, you're about to move it back over here. <laughs> so he's outside doing that. He comes in, sees my son and I eating at the kitchen table, and he goes, good morning. Good morning. My kid's like, ha. Huh? <laughs> my father-in-law's like, come outside. Mike, I wanna show you something. Got something to show you. I'm like, ah, you know, I'm good. I'm gonna stay over here with unconditional love. <laughs> I'm cool. And he's like, no, no, it's gonna be great. Come out, you're gonna love it. I'm like, okay. So I walk out to the front of the house. He opens up the door, we step out. And he points to the flagpole. And on the flagpole, the gay pride flag is flapping in the breeze. Right? And he looks at me and he looks at his flagpole and he goes, that's for you. <laughs> I didn't even write that joke. <laughs> it happened at me. There's literally a living, breathing, running around receipt for my heterosexuality. <laughs> In the house, I came inside his daughter. 
And he's still like, I don't know, dude, I'm not fully convinced. <laughs> you earn your living using your words. <laughs> In fairness to him, he did have to see me giggle into a MacBook Pro for a full year. <laughs> yeah, and every once in a while, I'd put on a wig and a costume and sachet in his front yard. My wife would film me with an iPhone. Never saw the final product, had no idea what it looked like. Just saw that and was like, they're gonna live here forever. <laughs> but that's the difficult thing to, to grapple with, right? It's a frustrating situation, but I'm also really grateful. That silver lining stuff, that's for real. You know what I mean? It, I am grateful because this, especially this, this got taken away for a full year. That's why I'll always be grateful, always appreciative of the fact that you guys came out. This is killer. Seriously, I really appreciate it. I genuinely appreciate it. Yeah. And you know, all that, all that positivity and silver lining, got, it got me thinking about my own thing because the thing, that I, the, the thing that I really appreciate and will never let go of is the fact that I got to spend a full year with my son. Every single day for a full year, back to back to back, consecutively. I'll probably never get that much time with him like that ever again. It was incredible, incredible in that way. We had a lot of firsts during the year. We had a couple lasts. We took our final shower together. <laughs> Recently, he's more of a bath baby, as babies tend to be. But especially when he was little, right? If we were in a rush to expedite the process, I'd run him into the shower, power wash his asshole, <laughs> throw powdered soap in his face like he's heading into Shawshank, <laughs> and just dry him off, and then Kobe right into the crib, you know? <laughs> but now, now he's two and a half. He's autonomous standing on his own, moving about, which is a major reason for why this was our final shower. <laughs> you know, I'm standing there and he's standing there. <laughs> it's just two dudes in a box at that point, you know? <laughs> and he's perfectly cock height. <laughs> like exactly, like I don't even need to measure my son. I could just put my dick against a door frame, <laughs> pencil it and be like, that's my boy, 23 months. <laughs> That's how perfect it is. On the nose, literally, on the nose. <laughs> so we're taking what neither of us knew was our final shower. And uh, for the first time, he noticed my penis. It's basically a big skin chandelier for him. <laughs> and he even said it. He looked at it, he goes, peeny. And I was like, that's right, buddy. That's a penis. I have a penis and you have a penis. We both have a penis. And my wife was right there. She's like, that's right. It's exactly like yours. And I was like, well, not exactly. I was like, one day you'll grow into this. She interrupted my Mufasa to Simba moment. I was gonna be like, one day this will all be yours. Everything the light touches is your kingdom. Don't go to the shadows, it's an elephant graveyard. <laughs> that part's about my asshole. But, uh... So yeah, he, he saw it, tried to touch it. He's a baby, it's right there. He just goes, peeny. Tried to grab it, and I was like, <laughs> Try to guide him out of the way. You know, I didn't want to be too aggressive. I didn't want to like chop down on his forearm and be like, wait for consent, you white male piece of shit. <laughs> I know, my son is a white male, but don't worry. I tell him that that's bad every day. <laughs> it's his original sin. So right after that, right, we put him down for bed. And my wife and I, we're still brand new. We like coming together at the end of every day, discuss the day's events, maybe break down some game film. <laughs> discuss strategy for next week's opponent. And my wife comes out of the bedroom and she's like, and she's like oh man, like, what do we do there? Should you have like, let him touch it? <laughs> she's like, because we don't want to mess him up sexually. 
and create a sexual blind spot for the rest of his life. So like, should you let him? And I'm like, here's the thing, I'm pretty progressive. But I draw the line at my toddler jerking me off. <laughs> in the middle of a shower. I don't want a plump-fisted, knuckleless hand job. <laughs> From my sweet baby boy as water softly cascades <laughs> onto my back. It's like, yeah, if that somehow fucks him up and creates a sexual blind spot where he goes through life thinking he can't jerk off his own dad. I think that means we succeeded as parents. I think we get a blue ribbon. It is amazing though, because I am, I am very tired. <laughs> that part was true. But it's weird, it's a different tired than when he first got here. I don't think it ever ends, it just kind of changes the way you feel, you know what I mean? When my son first got here, I was tired in the sense that I was tripping balls. I was up every one, two, three, whatever it was, hours, so I'm hallucinating. <laughs> Basically existing between realities, trying to keep this kid alive. It was actually a pretty easy transition for me because that's exactly what I was doing before my son got here. <laughs> I, did, I did mushrooms while my wife was pregnant because I wanted to meet my son before he arrived. <laughs> we did, we had a nice little powwow. Now, now it's different, because he's two and a half. He's mobile, he's all over the map. So now I'm athlete tired. Man, he's all over. I'm just like in a defensive stance all day. Trying to, moving my feet, trying to beat him to spots. If he makes contact, I take a charge. But he's this tall, so it's always helmet to helmet. I know, my dick definitely has CTE. It drools and often forgets why it walked into the kitchen. My dick is like Aaron Hernandez. It's a closeted homosexual that may have killed three people. It is interesting because just watching him live, like, you know, I was always taught as a kid that human beings have an innate instinct to survive. It's built into us, right? We need, we want to survive. We can't even drown ourselves unassisted. We need to tie a brick to our foot or some have a friend push us down. I look pretty deeply into this. <laughs> but I've never, I've never disagreed with a hypothesis more in my entire life, just watching my son live. He loves life, and the only thing he loves more is trying to shut the game off forever. That's it, he's like, oh, is that a banister with a 13-foot fall? That looks like a pretty fun time to flip right over. What is that, a sword for some reason? Let's swan dive right into that. Is that a four-lane highway? I'll just jog out right into the middle of the street, hug a Dodge Caravan doing 55. I'm like, buddy, you might need to uh, create some more memories first. Because I might forget your face. No, you're right. It's you that should have that sensitivity. <laughs> My son is, uh, he's cursing. I fucked up. I did, I reacted. You're not supposed to react to the curse, but I've never heard something that cute curse before. We're sitting at the table and I hear fuck, and I'm like. And I saw him light up like he got that attention. Just... And as a comedian, I know that feeling, so I was like, that's good shit, right? I can't even be mad at him, because he does it right. Like, now I'm trying to ignore him. I'm trying to extinguish the behavior, but he knows that I know <laughs> that he curses. So he'll try to get my attention. He'll be like, <laughs> he'll go, fuck! <laughs> fuck! <laughs> Dada! <laughs> fuck! <laughs> like, God, he's doing it right. <laughs> That's why I can't be mad. He's an advanced cursor. He is. I have immigrant family members that have been in this country for 30 years, still don't know how to curse. They'll stub their toe and be like, son of fuck! Like that's... <laughs> My son is two years old, advanced. We're watching Cars 3 for the 498th time the other day. He's on my chest, we're watching it. Out of nowhere he goes, fuck this. I'm sick of this shit. I'm going upstairs. And then he walked upstairs. 
And I was like, dude, that's exactly right. <laughs> it's just amazing, like, the, the perspective shift. You know what I mean? Because all I've known up until this point is what it's like to be parented. Now I have all this new, new empathy for my parents. I really do. Like, I, I, I've been going through life up until now thinking my parents never taught me shit. <laughs> Didn't prepare me for adulthood. <laughs> Did not bestow a single lesson upon me. But it turns out I wasn't listening. <laughs> As a parent, I'm getting hit with like all these butterfly effect memories. I'm like in positions with my son and I'm like, oh, that's right. <laughs> and I remember certain things my parents tried to accomplish. Like I don't know how to cook, still to this day. Don't know how to cook, can't scramble an egg. And I've always looked at that as a personal failure of my parents. <laughs> so wow, you really let me enter adulthood not knowing how to scramble an egg? <laughs> but I remembered that they absolutely tried to teach me, and they did it in the proper parenting way. They did it enthusiastically, excited, really pumped me up. They're like, Michael, come on down here. Get in the kitchen. We're going to teach you how to cook. You're going to learn how to scramble an egg. You're going to get to eat anytime you want. You'll be self-sufficient. It's going to be amazing. Get in here. And I looked at my parents, and I was like, I'm going to be in the NBA. Why would I ever need to know how to scramble an egg? My chef will scramble my egg. What, do you not believe in me, mom and dad? That is unfortunately entirely true. I really, I really believed until a late age that I was going to the National Basketball Association. I played community college basketball and assumed the Knicks were just a day away from calling <laughs> at all times. And honestly, I blame me playing too long. Like, I wish I quit earlier. But I blame me playing too long on the fact that social media didn't exist yet. Didn't exist. So I was an incredible basketball player for my town. And I knew nothing else. It's like, well, surely my town's talent pool is indicative of the rest of the world. But had I had social media and I could scroll through and see that there were Zion Williamson's in existence, <laughs> just a 15-year-old, six-foot-five, 275-pound kid doing windmill dunks from the free throw line, I would have looked at that and been like, I should probably learn how to scramble an egg. <laughs> Everything's good, though. <laughs> My wife and I are solid. It took us a while, though, to get back to the sex. It's pretty sweet. It's weird, though, now, because the, ta you know, the conversation about the second child is kind of coming up. And uh, we're, not, you know, we're not ready yet. We're both saying that. We're also doing nothing to stop it. I'm not wearing a condom. What am I, a child? Yeah, so I've just been pulling and praying for two and a half years. But I'm a comedian, so my timing is impeccable. <laughs> it's wild, though, because we've had the conversation, right? Neither of us are ready for the second one. Who knows? It might happen, whatever. But my wife's lips are saying something different than her, I guess, other lips. <laughs> <laughs> so anytime we have sex and I go to pull out, she fucking UFC leg locks me <laughs> around the waist. I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> How dare you try to rape a baby out of me? <laughs> this has to be a consensual conception. <laughs> it just took us a while. It took us a while to get back into the full swing of things. And I figured out why. It's because raising a child is probably the least erotic activity two human beings can do. <laughs> right? There's nothing about it that you know, sets the stage for romance, intimacy, or anything like that. So you have to get good at compartmentalizing. You have to separate what you do during the day and then what you hope to accomplish <laughs> later that night. But it's tough for me, because I'm with my son and my wife all day, and all day my wife will be like, oh my God, Mike, he's your twin. He looks exactly like you. <laughs> it's fucking freaking me out. He's your carbon copy, he's your twin. And then eight hours later, I'll be inside of her, and I'm like, still look like your baby boy. <laughs> Psst, 
dries her right up. I don't know, then it felt like I was inside a cat's tongue. <laughs> took, me, uh, took me six months to go back down on her. I know, not by choice. Not by choice, for real. I love going down on my wife. I have to. <laughs> I do. My dick is not a leading man. It's the goofy friend. <laughs> my dick comes in, kills it for a scene or two, and then fades into the background. <laughs> and then good old Matthew McConaughey <laughs> comes in, puts a little southern raw in him, <laughs> does the heavy lifting, and then sells you a Lincoln. So I knew, I knew it had been a long time, right? I wanted to put on a show. I wanted to remind my wife of what we had before our son got here. So I went down slow, and I kissed her C-section scar. Not in an attempt to be hot. I wasn't trying to be erotic in that moment. I was genuinely trying to say thank you. I was, I was trying to say thank you for what she went through and what she sacrificed bodily to bring us our baby boy. And my wife just looked down at me and goes, my scar doesn't have a cliff. He's like, why don't you mosey on a bit down south and visit the hood? <laughs> a lot of women laughed at that one. Not enough men, if you ask me. That was a clitoral hood joke. It takes a deep vaginal understanding to truly appreciate it. Maybe not deep, more surface. But I don't know, you know, I, I know, I know I'm filthy. I know this is insane. It's because I grew up in a repressed Irish Catholic family. So we just never talked about sex, never. So now that I have a microphone, I'm like, have you guys heard of jizz? <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, we, we're good. <laughs> I'm excited, I'm excited to turn the table on that. You know what I mean? I'll be, I wanna talk to my son about that stuff, have difficult conversations, obviously not yet. <laughs> But in time, I'll probably be the first canon father in our lineage to have a conversation with his son. <laughs> so that's exciting, you know what I mean? And, and regardless, regardless of what his orientation is, obviously I don't know yet, could be straight, gay, other, I have no idea. He's been teething for a long time. <laughs> which I know might not connect for all of you. But basically, teething, teething means he's been deep-throating every toy he has for a while, and nobody warned me about that. Nobody told me one day I was gonna walk in on my brand new baby, and he would just be like, Wah! just bang in the back of his esophagus with Elmo's leg. Wah! What's a letter of the day? Clap, clap, it's a letter of the day. Clap, clap, it's a letter, it's a letter. So it did make me start to wonder, you know, whether or not my son is, is gay. And not out of concern, out of curiosity. Right? I've never had a gay member of my family. Somehow homosexuality has missed 100% of the Irish Catholics. <laughs> yeah. In my family, so you keep spinning the wheel, eventually it's gonna land on you, right? And obviously I wouldn't care. I think if you truly care about that, you probably got some deep-seated shit inside yourself. You want to iron out? I hope I would respond with as much empathy, love, and support as my son could possibly need. I have a buddy. He has a seven-year-old son. He, we, we talk parenting. He's kind of my parenting guru. I go to him. We workshop ideas back and forth. You know, it's, it's a good outlet. And he's a, he's a really good guy. He's got a good heart. He's not textbook woke. So he's what the internet would call a Nazi. But he's a good guy, I know where his heart is, right? And we're talking about this, how we would each respond if either of our sons came out. And he's like, listen, like, I, I don't hate gay people. Which you know something enlightened is coming right after that. <laughs> I don't hate gay people, I just don't wanna picture my son doing that. I'm like, here's an idea. How about you don't picture your kid fucking anybody? <laughs> Super solved. I don't care if my kid is the straightest dude on earth. I'm not gonna spend time home on the weekends when he's in high school being like, I bet my son is eating so much pussy right now. 
if I know my baby boy, he is chin deep in some clam. Right now, it is oyster shucking season. And my son just rented scuba gear. Same if he was gay, I wouldn't care, I wouldn't picture it. The only thing I would want out of my son if he was gay is I would want my son to be the most dominant power bottom of all time. I'm talking early 2000s Shaq, just moving motherfuckers. Straight unearthing dicks. Like he's tearing a turnip out of the soil. That's the type of alpha homosexual I'd like to raise. But I'm excited, you know, those tough conversations. I'm excited, you know? Cause my parents didn't really talk to me about sex. Like my dad, my dad tried to talk to me about sex when I was 19 and driving him to the Knicks game. <laughs> like a full beard, I'm on the George Washington Bridge. My dad's like, so you know how to like, uh. I was like, easy there, Tim Allen. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm good. I've been raw dogging the neighbor for the better part of four years, so. <laughs> it's totally true. You wanna know what happened to her? She's now my wife. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it pays to go skins early. My mom was the one that like, you know, she gave me information, which is really progressive on her part because she is Irish Catholic. Her mother was straight off the boat. My mother went to Catholic school from the time she started until the time she stopped. And it was that level of Catholic school where like the nuns would beat the shit out of you. You know, that much love for Christ. My mom would be like six working on her penmanship. A nun would come over, wrap her across the knuckles. When your hand heals, you're right, perfect cursive. Oh, peace be with you. And also you. <laughs> so she couldn't talk to me. It was too uncomfortable, which I totally understand, you know? But she, but she gave me information, which again, it's pretty cool. When I was 12 years old, my mom bought me a book called What's Happening to My Body. And I used to jerk off to the illustrations <laughs> of girls going through puberty. Each picture had like a few more pubes, and I was like, yeah, that's enough. <laughs> I got that book as a paperback, it left hardcover, for sure. <laughs> so, first ever laminated edition. <laughs> but now, like, you have to. You have to talk to your kids about sex because of the internet. You know what I mean? You can't just like plop your kid in front of a computer and be like, find the truth. <laughs> That's how you get a 13-year-old flat earther that beats off with a belt around their neck. That is. <laughs> Too much information, not enough guidance. <laughs> He's lucky though, because the internet is a fully formed thing. That's lucky. We got the internet, I got the internet. When I was in eighth grade, it was like a puberty make-a-wish. <laughs> it was insane and we had no idea what it was, but I do remember knowing that I was gonna jerk off to it. I remember the first things that I used to masturbate to, I used to download female orgasm noises from LimeWire and Kazaa. <laughs> and jerk off like a kid in the 30s listening to the radio. <laughs> it's Little Orphan Annie. <laughs> Drink your Ovaltine, kids. It's just, it's interesting, you know what I mean? It's such a different experience now until then because, you know, I talk to younger guys about their porn experience and in shows, not on the street. <laughs> just running up to them on the sidewalk, like, what, what did you watch? <laughs> it's for research. <laughs> you know, because it's different. The internet is established. Like, how, old, how old are you, buddy? 27. 27, okay. So even those 10 years, totally different world. You grew up with the internet, right? Yeah, yeah had it. First things you masturbated to? Internet? Good for you, buddy. <laughs> Alone? <laughs> it's funny, you gave like kind of a, yeah, face. But that is a generational thing. You, you, so you were alone, but listen to me. I grew up Irish Catholic as well, but in a different time. And the first time I ever watched porn, I was with 11 of my best friends. <laughs> 
because we had one tape, one TV, and a limited amount of time. Before somebody's mom came in with grocery bag. What the fuck is happening? Is this teamwork masturbation? It's like, granted, the high fives might have been a bit excessive, but everything else. It, it's kind of amazing, you know what I mean? Like, it, at least you had your own probably personal computer or device or something like that. Young people have that. That's incredible, because we only had one family Toshiba. <laughs> For real, yeah. I don't think, I think they make cars. <laughs> and my dad would constantly give it viruses from looking at porn and would publicly blame me to my family. He'd be like, Kate, Kate, your son got the computer sick again. Gave the computer a virus. And she's like, what? What is he looking at? I gotta see. She'd run upstairs and be like, Indian lesbian teens with a double-sided dildo? That's a refined palate for a 13-year-old. My dad was like, I know, it's crazy, I don't get it. Meanwhile, he has chicken tikka masala all over his tits. <laughs> and it's funny, like, getting caught is a life experience that's kind of being wiped off the earth. Do you know what I mean? Because it's too easy not to. You just erase the cookies, get rid of the history, all that shit. We had to bury evidence like we were a mobster in a RICO case. Tangible evidence, magazines, tapes, hard socks, you name it. <laughs> we had to get rid of it. I remember the worst thing that I had, right? I had this big Ziploc bag filled with cutout pictures of naked women. Like a serial killer. <laughs> Just cut out body parts jammed into this bag that I was so embarrassed and ashamed of after every use, I would <laughs> dig a hole under the shed in the backyard and bury it there like a fucking raccoon. Every time I finished, I'd pull up my pants, I'd have a glazed belly, I'd run it into the backyard, <laughs> dig a hole, cover it with dirt, cover it with leaves. Every time there was a hard rain, I'd have a fucking panic attack. <laughs> thinking about the water just washing these pictures onto the backyard and my parents discovering who their son really is. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming out. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like I'm just standing here. It doesn't feel good. Yeah. Like, said Daddy. I'm just waiting to start. Whether at the bonfire or Jim and Sam, I'm curious. Do I need a hype man to come with me up at serious? I'm serious. The doubters will learn like how I'm stern. My racial with success is my essence is Steve Byrne. The fuck you thinking, you little twinks? This ain't Nikki singing. This ain't for Bob. I murdered Saget, sent him packing. Really, my bag's expanding like I'm hyperventilating. And I'm hating every Amy ever since my mic was taken. Now I'm always packing and hanging out with two mics. And you might lose sight, bitch. I'm itching to get into few fights, which will lead to me to be an evil icky hickey with the foreign stick. You think, but this rap ain't even a little dicky. I mean, I'm Kevin Kaza with a dream. And I'ma see a field of bitches coming after me. Cause I'm wheezy drinking. Lean, mix with prickles being mean, and I got a chandelier trying to be like chandeling. Open mouths get fed, yo. Now I'm eating crumbs very soon, making bread though. Every man, not really. I be acting humble, ripping hicks off like Larry. Open mouths get fed, yo. Now I'm eating crumbs very soon, making bread though. Every man, not really. I be acting humble, ripping hicks off like Larry. Open mouths get fed, yo. Now I'm eating crumbs very soon, making bread though. Every man, not really. I be acting humble, ripping hicks off like Larry. Try that. This place is great, isn't it? Yeah. It's like they 
feel like there should be some giant young girl holding strings and just controlling me. A little bit of a bug out. So I'm nervous as shit. I'm glad the mic came out clean because it could have been like my first blowjob and just... That would have been no good for anybody.